a lot of it in there, then it feeds, it fuels a algae bloom because you have all these single-celled organisms that are saying, woohoo, we've got all of the food we could possibly want. They reproduce like crazy. And because nitrogen goes in pulses with storm events, it'll come, there'll be a huge bloom, and then it'll taper off. And then you can't sustain the population of algae, and so the algae die. And when the algae die, they trickle to the bottom and then the bacteria take over and it's the bacteria in the process of consuming the dead bodies that use up the oxygen and really hypoxia is really low oxygen or anoxia which is no oxygen at all and you can imagine that nice anemone <laughs> that if you are a an organism that lives planted on the ground that these organisms can't, they don't have the choice of going away. A fish can probably swim away, but even then we found that fish that will try to get away from low oxygen conditions will just go out far enough along the edges of it and then they'll pressure the populations that exist there. So it's not a good scenario any way you look at it. And periodically we have fish kills. There haven't been lots of fish kills, but Peri periodically we will get them and these are the pictures that came up in 2015 oh, on uh, Long Island. It's a very visceral, I mean to see this image of all these fish, it's really very striking. Uh, it's not a good use of fish <laughs> as you can imagine. And this is because of low oxygen? This is low oxygen, yeah. And a lot of this has to do, I mean, Long Island has got a huge program working with homeowners on reducing nitrogen inputs uh, either through septic or through other alternatives, you know, fertilizer, because a lot of these blooms are coming directly from populated centers along the coast. What does that smell like? With all these fish? Yeah, so. yeah. And the problem, is, I mean, you know, it, it is a resource, so it's unfortunate that they've all died. It's too bad we couldn't turn that into some kind of, but what the fishermen do is they load them up and take them out into the ocean and, and dump them which is probably some organisms are taking advantage of that, no doubt, but it's a waste of organic resources that should otherwise be <laughs> you know, living. So this is actually, I think, a success story. This is Bunker. That was the picture of the whale at the very beginning. And the whales are coming back into Long Island because about four years ago, the Northeast Marine Fisheries Program put a limit on menhaden catch because menhaden were being overfished. And it's amazing the difference that I've seen just in Osprey alone. I mean, I, I live fairly close to the water and I find what are called menhaden cheeks. It's basically the only part that animals don't live. It's this, this cartilaginous here, it's hard. And I find them on my yard, in my yard where the ospreys have eaten everything and they've just kind of spit out the cheeks. So you know that there's a really good population when you see the osprey going, and the population of osprey has just, just gone amazing. So this is basically a young menhaden. They're called Bunker. And the last four or five years, it's been extraordinary in the fall. You can see the water just popping with fish. And when you see this, that's when you see the birds. And that's when you see the whales coming in. That's when you see all of the species. This is a seal. The seal go crazy with them. And this is striped bass. And very often when you see this, it's because the striped bass are going after, or the bluefish are going after the concentrations of this fish as feeder fish. And that's what gets the, the uh, recreational fishermen all excited. So it's amazing how just that simple modification, don't take as many menhaden, and see the life that comes back into the sound. But were they, were menhaden just bait fish? Is that what they were eating before not consumption? Yeah, yeah. So in the last, these were all 2015, which seemed to have been an amazing year, but we actually had beluga, and we have had, dolphins have come back consistently in the last four years, which is, um, I have never, in all the time I've been there, I've never seen dolphins. I still haven't seen them. I've only seen pictures of them, but people are talking about, and breaching whales. It's like, this is, this is an urban sea. This is the most people impacted estuary there is in the United States. And, uh, you know, to have a minke whale, this is really extraordinary, and it's very encouraging. And this, this is a great way to engage people in helping to protect Long Island Sound. Even if you don't see it happening, if you see a picture of like that fish, the whale, the humpback whale at the very beginning with all the fish coming out, that's, that's pretty visceral, I think. I would be motivated to know more about it and what I could do. 
Long Island Sound is also really important because for those people who are economists in the audience and don't really care about, you know, food webs. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> This is a pretty good number, and this this fluctuates. There's been a lot of studies that have been done, you know, anywhere from 17 million to you know 32 billion uh, in what's generated through the use of Long Island. That's recreation, that's commerce, that's transportation, that's any number of things. It's important. And since 2015, which is when the the 20 year update to the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan was finally put into action was was created I was a part of the process of helping to, to bring the mental you know everybody who was a part of the Long Island Sound study which is you know state and federal and nonprofits and academic institutions all coming together and that that was a hair-raising <laughs> opportunity to but but we put together this plan that really I think is a, a good road forward and in addition to that plan the environmental protection agency has got a nitrogen reduction plan there's there has been development of what's called the long island sound blue pan plan and i'll tell you a little bit more about that long island sound report card and then line app which is the long island nitrogen action action plan <laughs> good yes <laughs> it says right there okay <laughs> all right and what I love is th there was a, a book that was put together, all the scientists came together and put all of the research that they have done and historically into a volume. It's a really dry volume to read, but it's got all of the really good information if you want to, to know, you know the, the science behind what we understand. This is a study, however, that was done by Jamie Baudry in, uh, at University of Connecticut where I work. And what she did was we know a lot about Long Island Sound, the, the center part of Long Island Sound. We know where the hypoxia is, we know when it comes, we have all of that information. We didn't have as much information about all the coves and embayments. There are, well, she studied 110 coves and embayments on the, the New York and Connecticut side. And she looked at a variety of factors, looking at uh, fertilizer, septic, sewer, atmospheric deposition, and uh, d uh, nitrogen deposition onto land for all of these different coves and embayments. And this is a huge eye-opener because what it basically was saying that even if the center area of Long Island Sound is healthier, which it is, we still have some coves and embayments that are really turning anoxic, they are losing their oxygen. And that's important because all that life that we talked about with the, the coves and embayments and where all of the salt marshes are and the, the brackish tidal marshes, that's really important. That's a big part of the health of Long Island Sound. So this is really, this has been a game changer in terms of where we're starting to focus our energy. We're starting to look inland, which I love because I live on the coast and I can talk to my neighbors who, you know, everybody is like, can you see the, the, the sound? Can you see the cove from your house? It's even if it's like one little tiny part of a window or from your yard, everybody loves that they can see water or marshes. And this is the program, the Long Island Sound Watershed Regional Conservation Partnership Program that is the other part of my job, which is bringing resources, it's, you know, partners to look at runoff and nutrients going into Long Island Sound. It basically has three different project areas. So soil health, which works on creation of, of comprehensive plans to protect resources, soil resources. Resiliency, which has to do with the floodplain forests, and that was like the throwback to Irene. And forests. So forest management is the idea that if you keep a watershed forested, it's a lot better than if you overdevelop it because you're releasing carbon and excess nutrients every time you destroy forests. We also have that little thing called climate change that is clearly affecting Long Island Sound. It's affecting me. I'm not right on the water, but I'm low enough so that uh, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, had water completely around my house, which is kind of scary. Uh, so we're dealing with coastal resiliency. That's a big word around the Connecticut coast and the, the New York coast. It's talking about what are we going to do about rising 
rising coast, coastal areas, which is where the densest part of our population is. And by the way, in my town, as in all the Connecticut towns, that's where the lion's share of the money from taxes comes in. So if you start losing those big expensive hoses, houses on the, the coast, the tax burden to those people who are not on the coast is astronomical. So it's a huge issue. But the other issue is we're starting to see over time a change from cold water species going down and warm water species going up. So some of the losers, uh, flounder is expected to be lo to the numbers go down, and we're starting to see some invasive species come in. Lionfish, which is poisonous, lion's mane jellyfish, which seems to come and go, but it's terrible if you want to go out swimming and there's a bunch of, of jellyfish. It just is not a, a fun thing. So we've got a what's called a sentinel, sentinel monitoring team, and they're looking at all of the data that we have that would give us some indication of what the sound has been relative to then understanding how it's changing and if that can influence how we manage. And then I mentioned that there is the blue pant plan, which is, not surprisingly, it's a highway under there. There are pipes, lines, there are uh, fishing beds. Uh, the biggest agricultural land in Connecticut is actually underwater. We have more acres that are farmed in aquaculture than we do agriculture on land. So it's very important who owns what and who manages what, and we see increasing need for gas pipelines, for communications pipelines. There have been uh, proposals for tunnels to go under Long Island Sound. So the Blue Pan is Connecticut's effort in, in working with New York to really pull together the experts to say what's under the water, what's important about what's under the water. We're even looking at a, a national uh, marine fisheries um, oh, a sanctuary site, basically, that would, would have a no anything on it, no fishing, no aquaculture, no nothing. They're looking for sites, one potentially at the mouth of the Connecticut River, which I would love. So this is a really important and way overdue process. There was a, a proposal about six or seven years ago, it was called Broadwater, and it was a liqui liquid, liquefied nitrogen gas platform that was proposed to come into the middle of Long Island so that tankers could come in and bring uh, uh, nitrogen or liquid gas, basically gas, as an alternative fuel source, which is good because Connecticut's a huge consumer of energy resources, but not a huge producer of energy resources. So we need ways to get energy resources into the state. And the idea was, let's put this big tanker thing, and then we have big tankers coming up and down Long Island to be able to load off and then bring that natural gas into the coastal areas. It was defeated only because of huge outcry from the public, which suggested that people love Long Island Sound. They did not want to look at that. They did not want that to be a part of what Long Island Sound was providing. So it was encouraging to see that. There's also, uh, in the last couple of years, a nonprofit organization has been working on what's called the Long Island Sound Report Card. Not surprisingly, at the, the deepest and furthest away from New York City, we have the highest water quality, and it kind of degrades completely by the time you get uh, to New York and to the East River and all of the concentrations there. Looking at a variety, phosphorus, chlor chlorophyll, this is an indicator of clarity of the water, dissolved oxygen, all important things, but this is very controversial, particularly when you start to get into these coves and embayments where people, often volunteer groups, have been monitoring for years, and you know, very little money goes into that, and it's a tough thing to do to try to engage the public, and then you get a report card that says D plus, one big score here, even though there have been some volunteer groups that have been working for years and have done a great job of cleaning up some of these, these uh, bays in there. So, it's actually all the way over here. Yeah, so here's, here's the Thames, here's the Connecticut, here's the Quinnipiac, where is this New Haven, and then here's the Housatonic. So the three big rivers are the Housatonic, the Connecticut, and the Thames. And that's 90% of the fresh water that's getting into Long Island is coming from those three, but 70% of that is the Connecticut. So I like to tell people 
<laughs> that if it goes in the ground, it goes in the sound. I love this. This is a whole ad campaign, and this actually came out of Puget Sound. They have a sense of humor out there. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have this guy, and the same thing with the black socks, you know, washing his car on the water, all these things. But, but it is useful to say that, because even though people think this can't, you know, if I just put my oil, I mean, how many people remember changing oil in their car? and putting it in a storm drain or putting it on, in the ground. I mean, that, those are the kinds of habits that die hard and are really important in terms of water quality, not only on the ground and into Long Island Sound, but in the ground. And that's a hard concept for a lot of people to look at, you know, it's what water's moving in the ground, really? And then it's, it's actually intersecting with water that's going out to Long Island Sound, wow. And I always like to, to shout out, give a shout out to, you know, there, there are these spider crab life forms that are very cool, but there's also the experience. I mean, I grew up, my family had a boat, and we were able to go out on Long Island, and that was part of what helped me understand that that's what I wanted to do, is to be somebody who advocated for nature. And, I, you know, I, I go out on trips with lots of different people, and to see kids, kids love cool things. They love life. They, you know, if they can get away from electronic devices long enough, this kind of stuff is very appealing. And that's what we need. Those are the future stewards because we're going to need them. So I tell people that, you know, there really is an estuary in your backyard because even though you, you know, if you were to drop an orange into the, the stream behind you and let it float, uh, you know, would it make it to Long Island Sound? Probably not. But the point is, is that system, we need all of the parts of a healthy watershed in order to ultimately provide the benefits to the estuary. So even though you may not live right on Long Island Sound, you live in a, an area that is contributing substantially to the total resources and, and health of that estuary. And as part of the the uh, RCPP program that's bringing money into Vermont for, for good farming practices. Stuart Hudson, who is with Audubon, Connecticut, I love this quote, with so many residents living in the watershed, this nationally significant estuary will require additional focus beyond its immediate shoreline if it is to remain a critical natural resource for people and wildlife. It's so true, and it's amazing how few people in Connecticut think watershed, which is why I love to be trying to engage people at all parts of the watershed because that's really where the health of the system is. So this is the RCPP project. I can be reached at a variety of Long Island Sound Study. I have my, my home office and then, and then this. So how long was that? Hmm. We had until 10? Oh, 10.30. <gasps> yeah, there's, I mean, there's training. You don't have to feel like you <laughs> Yes, well, okay, so. So, I, I'd be happy to ha answer any questions or, yeah. You put your contact information back up there. So, this is Milford. This is uh, just outside of, it's on the west side of New Haven. And you can see the dense population, and most of these houses uh, have been rebuilt in the last probably five to ten years. And in fact, in my, I, I live in a little tiny 888 square foot house that was built in 1956 on a little tiny street. I love it, I absolutely love it, but I'm also noticing that, that the street behind me, the street on the other side, and right on the water, which used to just be open land, is now at the foot of my street are two huge houses. And the house directly behind me was elevated. And the, the rule for elevating now, if you're buying and building new or tearing down, which is happening a lot, you have to elevate. And the, the amount changes, it's anywhere from 12 to 15 feet. And the house behind me sustained more than 50% damage to their structure in Sandy, so that required them to go up. I just went to my town um, planning department land use department with an idea to expand. I just want to put a room in my garage and then pull my garage forward so I can have one more room. 
and I all my setbacks I got 15 feet on this side 25 feet on the front so I was going in as a you know due diligence to say this is what I'm planning to do just running this by you to make sure that I, I'm okay and that's when I found out that FEMA now requires that they will look at 50% of the assessed value of your house and then they will look at the last 10 years of any additions that you've put in, anything that you've pulled a permit for, and take that 50% value, subtract any money that you've put into the house, and whatever is left over is what you have to work with to do anything to your house, beyond which you have to elevate the house. So <laughs> I can't do anything with my house. Now, were you flooded because the, the um, sound waters rose or because the river got dammed up? No, it was the sound, okay. but it was a really unique circumstance. The wind was forcing water into the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it was at a high tide. It was at an unusually high tide, and there was a lot of wind, and there was a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of factors. I don't expect, honestly, in my lifetime mm -hmm. to see sea level rise duplicate that. I think it's coming, but... I'm banking because <laughs> I'm not leaving my house. And that's been a really hard decision. I got to tell you, I've, I have wrestled back and forth because I've lived in my house for 25 years now and it's, it's the perfect house to retire to. It's all one level, it's tiny, easy to manage. And I, I live right on the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound and a cove. I couldn't afford to buy that house yeah. now. So I'm there. <laughs> I just have two questions. Yeah. Oh, if you look at the map of the sound, there's a, is that a seawall that runs up the, there's like a really, almost a straight, it almost looks man-made. Oh, a jetty. Is, the, that, yeah, the one that, that, uh, are you talking about where the? On the Atlantic side of it. Oh, on the Atlantic side? Yeah, keep going back. Uh, let's see. On the Atlantic side. This map? Yeah, th that strip. Oh, oh, this here. Yes. Yes, those are all beaches. Oh, okay. Yeah, because this is where the glacier ended. So rocks here, rocks here, because the glacier kind of retreated back. This was a lake, and then the dam broke, and then it retreated off and off. But all the fine particles ended up. So these are the Hamptons, the famous Hamptons. Yeah. And these are all barrier islands, so these guys could be screwed. <laughs> Sorry, but... So those are all naturally occurring? Yes. Oh, really? Okay. Just, it looks yes, it does. From when I first yeah. thought it man-made. It's really exquisite. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the density of population, it's not so exquisite, but, it's, but it's, these are amazing. And this is Jamaica Bay, which is right across from Logan Airport. And I mean, the, the density, the, you've got the Bronx, you've got everything in here. And yet, there's this wildlife area that's just amazing. So. And I just had one more question. What, who controls the bay? Is that federal, New York, Connecticut? Is there? The you mean Long Island? Yeah, I mean. The yeah, the yeah. the prop the property line the the state line goes right through. And in fact, the island of Fisher's Island, all of these string of islands here are actually in New York. Okay. So, so there's no federal international waters or anything? It's all no, the federal all waters are out. I think it's the it's continental the shelf. Of, of the state jurisdiction. Which is very hard. Right. Yeah, because... I was curious about, you know, yeah. telecommunication and pipelines underneath it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's why we're starting in Connecticut yeah. with the, the blue plan, with the idea that, you know, New York is working on that line app, so they, they're really going gangbusters. But, but they are a sole, sole source aquifer here. This is all sand. So they have a lot at stake here with pollution. You know, we have a lot of our water comes from reservoirs and is brought in through pipes. But here, the water that they have, once it's contaminated, it's contaminated. So they're really concerned about that. And so they're putting a lot of energy into educating people about septic. And, and actually, they have had not only septic, but cesspools which is basically open areas that's just a tank. There's no remediation at all. So that's, that's a huge 